Well, welcome. My name is John Buckwalter, and I have the distinct pleasure of serving as the Dean of the College of Human Ecology. And it's my pleasure to welcome you here to the Sugart Lecture this year. Today has been a very eventful day. We had a rousing lecture by our alumni fellow uh, this morning, and I expect nothing less than uh, that to continue this afternoon. And so I will get out of the way very quickly and introduce uh, Melody LeHue, the interim department head in the Department of Hospitality Management and Dietetics, who can uh, introduce the speaker and give you a little background on this lecture. Welcome. We're excited you're here. Well, I'm very excited to, to be here and to welcome you to the 41st annual Grace M. Shugart Lecture. Um, we're, we're delighted that you are here to, uh, to hear our speaker and to share in this, in this moment for, with us. But first, I want to do uh, some acknowledgement of our special guests. Um, we have in the audience with us uh, members of the Grace M. Shugart family. Uh, Jeffrey Shugart and his wife Joanne are from Lansing, Kansas, and they are here. They tend to join us every year, and so we are very appreciative of that. Also want to welcome faculty members from hospitality management and dietetics, as well as other departments across campus. We're very happy that you have come to join us today. Um, we also have uh, some additional guests. We have dietetics and hospitality professionals from Manhattan area and beyond, as well as uh, school nutrition colleagues from around the U.S., uh, and, and many of them are, are currently participating in a program this week offered by the Kansas State University Center of Excellence for Food Safety Research in Child Nutrition Programs. And I see a big group of them over there, so welcome to you as well. And then most of all, we are very pleased to welcome students who are here today. Um, it, it was actually uh, in honor of students that Grace M. Shugart uh, wanted to put together this lecture series. So we especially want to welcome all of the students that took time out of their day to come and be with us. So thank you. Now, to give just a little bit of information about the Shugart Lecture Series, um, it actually began in 1975 as a tribute to Grace M. Shugart, who it's named for. She retired as the head of uh, the department that at that time was known as Dietetics, Restaurant, and Institutional Management. She also served as a, a president of the American Dietetic Association, and she won the Kofer Award, which is that association's highest honor. Grace was a prominent leader in food service management and dietetics. She co-authored several of the seminal textbooks in that discipline, such as Food for 50 and Food Service in Institutions. When Mrs. Shugart retired after 20 years serving as department head, her, her wish was to endow a lectureship that would bring to campus outstanding leaders in dietetics or food service management in order to speak to students and faculty and professionals in the field. The early speakers uh, for the lectureship tended to be in the dietetics field, uh, since that was Mrs. Shugart's background and her area of expertise. But over the years, the department's scope has broadened, and it now includes restaurant management and food service. And so, so now speakers are selected from hospitality area as well as the dietetics field. This year, our honored lecturer is from the dietetics arena. And so we're here today to kind of celebrate the 41st consecutive year of this lecture series. And so now it's my privilege to introduce today's speaker, Penny McConnell. Penny is a registered dietitian and serves as a school food service and nutrition specialist in Fairfax County, Virginia. She, her uh, educational background, she holds a Bachelor of Science from the University of Manitoba, Canada, 
She also has a Master of Science from Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University. Penny directs the Food and Nutrition Services Program at Fairfax County Public Schools, and that system is the 11th largest school district in the country. This fact amazes me. That district serves over 186,000 people every day. So this is a very large and very diverse school district located near Washington, D.C. Penny has had a long and distinguished professional career. She is a past national president of the School Nutrition Association, which has over 65,000 members. She also uh, has been a uh, president of the Virginia School Nutrition Association and the Global Child Nutrition Foundation. She also currently serves on the advisory board for the Center of Excellence for Food Safety Research here at K-State. In 1999, Penny received the prestigious International Food Manufacturers Association Silver Plate Award for elementary and secondary school category. She is an active member in the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, and she received a medallion award from the Academy for her selfless service to the profession and that organization. If we would go through the list of awards that Penny has, has uh, been garnered uh, for her school nutrition program, we would be here way too long. And so I wanna leave some time for, for Penny to, to give her talk. So let's just say that, that Penny knows how to direct an award-winning school nutrition program. The last few years have been tumultuous ones for child nutrition programs. Some of you may have heard news about the many changes that are uh, going in place or mandated for the huge federally supported programs to feed our nation's children. Our children. Penny is a passionate champion for children and for nutrition. She's an innovative leader. And so we can think of no one better qualified to share with us today on the topic of navigating the sea of change. So please join me in welcoming the 41st Grace M. Shugart lecturer, Penny McConnell. Good afternoon. I'm sorry some of you got to see some of the slides, so we're gonna go back. Okay. So navigating the sea of change is my topic for today. But first of all, I want to thank you for the invitation uh, to present the 2015 Schugert Lecture at Kansas State University. Oh, I'm not doing well either here. Oops. Come on, fellas, what's going on? It's the computer because I didn't touch anything. Okay, I did not have the pleasure of missing, uh, meeting Ms. Shugart, but I know of her contributions to the dietetic profession and have used her widely recognized publication, Food for 50. I was delighted to meet her family this morning, the Kansas State faculty, students, and professional colleagues. I've named my lecture Navigating the Sea of Change. And as I enter my 50th year in school and nutrition feeding with Fairfax County Public Schools, I have seen many changes in the profession, the school district, and the clients we serve. I'd like to start off with a quote by Rick Edelman. He's a renowned financial planner. We're always developing, growing, and evolving in our lives and profession. Once we recognize that change is an everyday part of life, it helps us cope when a major change comes and realize the importance of being willing to modify what we do. However, some things such as fundamental values, morals, and beliefs about who we are and how we're going to lead our lives how we're going to interact with others, and what matters to us must never change. Today, as you browse the internet and research titles on change, you're overwhelmed by the number of resources. This reflects the fast-moving culture we find ourselves in today. 
For the past four years, my department and school district have found it extremely challenging to absorb and react to the constant and unexpected major changes in our working climate and culture. These include a new superintendent, new elected school board, and many stakeholders with their personal agendas. To survive and set sail for new horizons, I have researched the change process for possible new approaches to the topic, such as trying to understand what is happening in our community, how to react to the impact of social media, trying to understand new stakeholders' unrealistic agendas, as a leader, hopefully guiding my team members through the new expectations. What is changing in your world? As you can see from the slide, when you think about our world, it, it has very different circles. Community, here I'm, I'm just amazed at how little traffic you have. <laughs> in Washington, D.C., we are lined up for hours. So that's a major change when you think of my community. Work, diversity, reorganization, family, many of us caring for parents, dual income families, and other, and I put here technology. As we travel through these changes, we react emotionally and go through similar stages of grief as we would with a personal loss. These reactions can impact us physically, emotionally, intellectually, and spiritually. Change is an event which is external to us. It is generally imposed on us and not expected. Today, there are no natural landmarks indicating safe and unsafe waters with social media and now and me stakeholders. And I put that in quote, now and me. And their children are reacting the same way. With change, something old stops and something new starts. And this is often referred to as the transition period. And it includes stopping your current practice and going through an adjustment period and then starting the new activity. And this is a simplified version. We've got to get out of the old stops and then we react and we've got to accept the new. Transition is internal and is how we personally react to the change. According to Laura Stack, there are four stages of change. Number one, reaction. Each of us react to change in different ways. It may be disbelief, it may be stress, it may be shock. Think of the different reactions you experience when things change in your personal life. And the same is true in the working setting. Often this is referred to as the denial stage. Number two is resistance. Employees look to blame someone, and they may feel mentally or physically that they cannot get through the change. We all have a fear of the unknown. And what impact this change will have on my workload? Employees go through mourning the past, instead of trying to prepare for the future. The third stage is exploration. Employees slowly get out of their negative status and move into exploring new alternatives, accepting the change. Hopefully there's renewed creativity and enthusiasm. Number four is commitment. Employees have successfully adapted and accepted the change. The goal is to get all employees to this stage, and as leaders, the challenge is to meet and move all employees through this process. How long we stay at each stage is impacted uh, by how you're handling the change. Change is difficult because often we're powerless and lack control over matters related to government and our organization's plans which is unlike the control we have over our personal matters, such as finance, 
career, friends. Sadly, there is no right or wrong way to adjust to change. And we need to realize that change is the key to surviving and growing professionally and personally in today's world of continuous change. As a director and professional, I've strived to remember John F. Kennedy's quote, change is the law of life, and those who look only to the past or the present are certain to miss the future. I invite you to join me, oops, just a minute, please bear with me. Oh yeah, I invite you, boy, this is a challenge. Well, it didn't come up. Let me see if I can get it. Oh, okay, we'll go here and I'll, I'll read the other part. Let's, I want you to join me to set sail on the Energy Zone ship. I want to share with you some of my major navigational challenges with nautical terms and my program's current stage of change. I've been in, successful in several, but in others I continue in the change process and despite efforts on my part, have been unable to move to the commitment stage, which is the fourth stage. Like my national colleagues, I strive to keep my eye on the lighthouse to ensure our programs remain viable and continue to play a vital role in the nation's children's well-being and readiness to learn. In dealing with changes, I strive to practice the following survival skills. Keep an open mind. Stay flexible. I did have this on the screen, but it popped, so. Um, take an active role in the change process. Research and remain current on professional changes. Learn new skills if needed. Let go of the old and try the new. Be patient, because change takes time to be implemented effectively. And then, of course, very important, support your team members. Meanwhile, while I try to go through these survival skills, I'm often accused of going on the defensive, because I, like Rick Edelman said, refuse to give up my passion to talk, serve, and teach nutrition. The big issue that I want to cover first is demographics. And I've used the STAR as our navigation guide on this because STARS are a perfect navigational um, tool. Fairfax continues to be and experience a dramatic demographic shift with a multicultural clientele coming from over 100 countries and speaking over 200 languages. To quote USA Today in November 2014, if you want to see the future of the United States, come and visit an elementary school classroom in Fairfax County Public Schools. The demographic makeup of our district is reflected in both the student population and my workforce, and is a strength that we continue to celebrate. The changing mosaic of our communities and their needs impact menu planning, they impact student acceptance of new foods, and of course the federal meal components. We have to be very sensitive to other cultures and unique training requirements. Working with the district's Office, Office of Equity and Employee Relations, we continue to make accommodations, such as cultural head covers. You know, head covers are very important in food service. Schedule prayer time and location for the prayer time. Exclusion from food preparation tasks, such as handling pork pepperoni, even if you're wearing gloves. To meet cultural requests, you can see here the little pig by the pepperoni pizza. Pepperoni pizza has the only pork product that we're allowed to serve in Fairfax County. So we put a little pig on. 
We use all turkey products like turkey ham, but many of our clients and their parents do not believe us that it's turkey because of the word ham. So you see this training and, and education we are constantly challenged to meet. The changing demographics have required enhancing our training techniques and delivery to our workforce, many who are English speaking other languages. We have developed pictorial recipes, sanitation and safety signage, and customized interactive mini training modules for all aspects of our operations. Managers use their kitchen computers to train their team members. And if a real language issue exists, we'll ask another team member who may speak that language to demonstrate and explain the process to the employee that's having difficulty understanding English. English is our business language, but there are still language challenges. And the prominent languages in our district are Urdu, Farsi, Spanish, Korean, and Vietnamese. Many ESOL members lack computer skills or even have the availability of a computer at home. Yet our district is moving to go paperless. And the new venture for next year is that all of the employees will enter their own time and attendance online. This means that we are going to have to really spend a great deal of time and effort um, marketing and training our employees to do this. The best um, description we have, and this is posted in every kitchen, is the box of crayons, and the MIT members love this. We could learn a lot from crayons. Some are sharp. Some are pretty, some are dull, some have weird names, and all are different colors, but they all have to learn to live in the same box. So this is something that we have posted in the um, working areas, and I think it's really been very help, helpful for us to reinforce our need for sensitivity with our diverse population. My team has reached commitment as far as this area of um, navigational challenges is concerned. Uh, we are very receptive to our diverse students and, and parents, and we're sensitive to their rest for, re requests for accommodation within reason. The next area I want to cover is the political climate, and I see this as twofold. I think of the local political climate and the federal political climate, which we are faced with in, in our profession of school feeding. The entire district is facing a micromanagement oversight in areas um, such as finance, school start times, uh, fundraising, Freedom of Information Act. We're overwhelmed with the number of FOIAs that we have to respond to in all departments. And the directive from above is to accommodate because these stakeholders are not going away and their demands will continue. This was not the case in the past, so this change seems almost insurmountable because once you meet one of their demands, they come in with another. For food and nutrition services, there have been many historical changes that are navigational challenges even today. And I like this quote, no part of the organization is an island. We need each other, especially in the time when changes take place so rapidly, and the government becomes more complex and challenging. And I found this was very relevant to the political climate. Since 1994, all polystyrene items and trash used in food and nutrition services in my district and many homes are being processed into electricity via a process known as waste to energy. This takes place at the Energy Resource Recovering Center, which is located in Northern Virginia. I understand that energy from this plant provides electricity to approximately 75,000 homes. In the 1980s, in an effort to preserve millions of gallons of water, school cafeterias were directed 
by the county government, not the school district, to discontinue the use of dishwashing machines. This is why I use that quote. And this is where I was saying earlier, some of these changes are not internal, they're external. This required us to replace all reusable trays, plates, and utensils with disposable products. For the past 20 years, we've been very active testing and evaluating plates and trays and trying to come up with something that is durable, acceptable by the students, and has a good possible post-consumer content, and of course, cost. We have been unsuccessful to find a new tray and the students continue to find the current one acceptable. And so we have posted in every dining room this poster, where in the world does my pink tray go? Because we want students and teachers to know that it goes to the plant and converts to electricity. Uh, we have not been really successful with teachers. They continue to give that as an assignment. Why don't you write food service and ask them to go back to dishes? So in the fall, I usually get many, many letters from students. Why are you filling our landfills? In the 80s, um, our department was experiencing, not our department, the school district was experiencing financial difficulties and rapid growth. And they directed my department to devise a new form of food preparation because funds were not available to equip the entire kitchen. It could be a couple of hundred thousand dollars to equip a kitchen. And they needed to reduce the size of our kitchens. They needed that space for other things. So we researched and researched, and the district did not have the money to do a cook chill factory. So we came up with heat and serve was selected as our option because many board members at that time, you're talking the 80s, did not want what they called in those days TV dinners, the pre-plated meals. So we worked with our manufacturers to develop, to develop our recipes into frozen products. Well, today, industry is doing this nationally. They are developing products that are frozen, like spaghetti with meat sauce, taco filling, that meet the very strict federal nutrition regulations. So this is what we do, and this system continues today. However, we have that group of stakeholders, now us, real food, healthy food, clean label. We don't want what you're serving. Your food is not healthy. So this is my local political climate. Small group of people, very loud. For four years, they've caused my department to be adrift and bouncing between the boys and bells, which warn us of upcoming uh, challenges in navigation. Their chartered course is to remake a sound premier program and divert its operations to their agenda. Their goal is the service of fresh, healthy food that is not processed, and elimination of a list of additives and preservatives like this and all processed foods. They consider canned and frozen fruits and vegetables as unhealthy. And they believe a 16-year-old who can drive his car to school should not be allowed to purchase a cookie with his lunch. According to Dr. Keith Ayub, there is not a clear definition of processed food because it encompasses a whole range of things that are routinely done to food, and it actually serves a healthful process, ensuring that it is safe and healthful to eat. He believes we should not jump on the avoid processed food bandwagon, just so that we're trendy. He thinks as health professionals, we need to be the voices of informed reason, and that's what we've tried to do for four years but the stakeholders, initiatives which are not evidence-based and they do not acknowledge or respect the credentials and expertise of child nutrition professionals. In their opinion, our food, our menu options are not healthy. Even if we demonstrate our nutritional standards often exceed the federal guidelines. In response, they state the federal regulations are too lenient and they want their agendas implemented now. 
The Government Accounting Office reports that school meals are healthy and children who eat um, school meals consume, consume more fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and dairy items than lunches brought from home. This advocacy group has the potential of becoming a regional tsunami in Washington, D.C., which could have a major impact on the financial survival of some school feeding programs. And not only are institutional clean labels not readily available, the expense to the product is very high. Last week, we were researching a new Italian dressing prepackaged for the chef's salads that contained two additives that this group wants eliminated. And the manufacturer said, fine, we can make it for you, but it'll be at least $5 more a case. Well, that adds up. That adds up, and it's a real challenge for us. So to appease the stakeholders and parents who really are challenged with their children's special diets and um, allergies, we post extensive ingredient information on our website. And regrettably, despite four years of extra time and effort on the part of my team, we continue in the resistance and exploration stage of change. So we have not reached commitment with this group, which is sort of tragic. The next area I wanted to cover is the federal political climate. The Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act um, came about in 2010. And it has a lot of very, very valuable and important, important um, movements for the school nutrition programs. But I fear there's a little bit of rough water at this time, and it may continue because in 2015, we're going to be having the reauthorization bill for school feeding. And none of us really know what lurks ahead. Will it be high winds, thunder, and lightning, or calm seas? This is a list of some of the items that came up in the Hunger, Hunger Free Kids Act, and I won't go into every one of those. Just to say that many of us had implemented these standards years ago as far as the meal pattern components. And so we support their initiatives. Uh, the one area that some of us have challenges with is that the students must select a green or red star. These are the, um, our lunch is called the all-star lunch and there are five stars representing protein, grains, milk, vegetables, and fruit but the child cannot get a reimbursable meal unless they have a vegetable or a fruit on their tray. So that's been a challenge for some of us. However, there are other unfunded mandates, such as professional standards for all school nutrition employees, which will be effective um, July 1, and the yet-to-be unpublished um, wellness policy. And I commend Kansas State University for your very strong partnership with the Kansas State Department of Education. You continue to provide excellent training for the state's school feeding professionals and have a state-of-the-art program. The creative collaboration with Kevin Saar and uh, Cheryl Johnson is a premier program and supports the new regulation on professional standards. So you are there. You've got that one in place. I just am envious and wish Virginia had the same partnership. The new meal pattern, of course, promotes fruits and vegetables, whole grains, reduced fat, and sodium. And these are good and complement, as I said, what many of us are doing. However, many of us are concerned with the strict sodium restrictions that they're recommending, and that may change. And USDA has finally, I think, admitted that many districts are experiencing rising food costs, increased plate waste, and reduced participation for paying students. My district is 75% paying students. So needless to say, I have lost money the last two years and participation with the paying child. The National Institute of Health projects the average student wastes $33 of federally funded school lunches each year. The average person in the general population wastes almost that much in total meals during one month. 
However, this is nowhere close to the amount of food waste students see at home. Students need to be taught that food waste is unacceptable. At the urging of former Congressman Wolf from my district, my office in collaboration with schools have developed a letter of understanding with schools to collect safe leftovers from school lunches, but I also added lunches brought from home and to take them to local food banks. And my team supports this initiative, but we're challenged with teachers because we need them to remind students, do not take every component if you're not going to eat it. That's offer versus serve, other than the fruit or vegetable, you have to do that. But do not take it if you're not going to eat it to give it to the food bank because there's some of those things on your tray that cannot go to the food bank. So this is a learning experience we have to still continue to instill in our children. I'm sure in Kansas you've heard or read that there is a school lunch fight going on between the School Nutrition Association, some directors, and advocacy groups as we approach the 2015 reauthorization bill. In March, the School Nutrition Association Legislative Conference was held in Washington, D.C., and we met with our representatives, and the majority of us asked for flexibility for some of the regulations from the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act based on our individual school needs, not changing the nutritional content, but other things. I know some believe we are lowering our nutrition standards for the program when we ask for flexibility, but we're all focused on the nutritional well-being of all our students. And again, I repeat, the most concerned um, initiative we're worried about is sodium, because the research is not there that children should have less sodium. All the research has been done on adults. So when I look at this, we can't dwell on the storm. We have to focus on the light and let it guide us safely home. And that's what we'll do when reauthorization is unveiled. So in this area, I think that we're at the stage of change of exploration. And I think all of us will embrace whatever new regulations come down the um, course of the, our ride down the um, sea. Marketing your program. Um, is an anchor, and it permits us to stop and continually reassess our programs. The food and nutrition program in my district is branded as the Energy Zone, and besides serving breakfast and lunch, we've developed several nutrition education programs and venues to uh, market the program and give us the opportunity to interact with our customers in the classroom and the entire school community. Give me five colors that jive. We promote fruits and vegetables on our menus with little characters, and that's to encourage them to try new items such as star fruit or mango. Kids cooking uh, is a very popular program where we go in and teach the kids how to make snack pizza, fruit kebabs, and as part of this lesson, they're also using um, some techniques for um, recipes like washing your hands, food safety and uh, basic nutrition in hopes that this booklet we give them goes home for the parents to use as well. But our ultimate goal is to have them do some nutritious snacks when they have friends over for a party. 95210 is zip code to your health. Uh, every October, this is promoted in every one of our schools. The teachers get trivia sheets for every number. Nine is nine hours of sleep. Uh, five is eating five servings of fruits and vegetables. Two is two hours of screen time. Uh, one is one hour of physical activity. And zero is zero sugary drinks. And I did have a parent question, well, does that screen time mean the amount of time at school too? No, that's recreational screen time. This has been very successful though. Another area that you're reading a lot about, and I think you do a great deal of this in Kansas, is uh, school gardens. It's a national initiative. It's imperative that students learn where their food comes from. And in a district like mine, where we used to be rural, but now we're urban, in fact, we opened our first elementary in a high-rise office building this year um, because of limited space and land to build new schools. We've got 33 gardens. And we've developed a packet for the teachers here on um, how we 
feel they should handle the garden food because we want to use it in the school lunch program. And there's um, a picture of one of our schools where the kids, kids are picking the uh, lettuce for us to use. These nutrition education activities are very popular and they reinforce and support the district school nutrition education curriculum. We're very customer service um, oriented. We listen to our students. Nothing goes on our menu that hasn't passed a monthly taste test party with 70% um, selection by the students. The dining area is a huge impact on school meal participation. However, we do not control the number of lunch periods, the length of the lunch periods, and often the high school youngsters will tell us the lines are just too long to wait in. So we have a challenge there that we continue to work on. To ensure our program is current, um, I do a reality check with my team leaders every year, and I ask them to answer these questions and submit them. What do we need to begin doing? What do we need to stop doing? What do we need to continue doing? And I adapted this reality check from Jack Welch's uh, Finding a Better Way Every Day. He's the former CEO of GE. And it's worked very well. And then through the nominal group technique, I'll, we'll consolidate all these and come up with one or two priorities for the next school year. We do everything annually in our district because things are just changing so quickly. In the past, you were able to do a two, three, four-year strategic plan, but we've not been successful with doing that uh, recently. So at this stage of change, we're an exploratory and commitment. So we're constantly, the reason I put exploratory there, because you constantly need to get out of your comfort zone and look at ways that you can answer your program. Marketing yourself. I think it's very important that we market ourselves. And to students in the audience, I challenge you to become an active advocate with a positive cause that will make an impact on you, your community, and profession. I got into this profession and developed my passion for school feeding nationally and internationally because of a very strong mentor. Adelaide Neely was the first director in Fairfax County Public Schools, and she instilled in me the need to be active in professional associations and to give back by accepting committee appointments and running for elected office. The return is invaluable, and I believe has helped me with the skills needed to face and navigate the skis, the skis, the seas of change in my chosen profession. I also suggest that the students network with colleagues and professionals and expand your network among those who have skills that you want to improve on and master. Consistently strive to think creatively on behalf of your organization, value lifelong learning, and continuing education, including change management. The Global Child Nutrition Foundation is a catalyst for school feeding. As I enter my new journey of retirement, I'm fortunate that I've cultivated a passion for the Global Child Nutrition Initiatives. Globally, more than 350 million school-aged children are severely hungry, and over 115 million of them do not attend school. The number continues to grow exacerbated by food and economic conditions and civil strife. More needs to be done to expand school feeding, programs that serve as lifelines to millions of disadvantaged children, especially girls, throughout the world. The Global Child Nutrition Foundation is a volunteer-driven organization, and its business is conducted by an international board of directors. It does not offer money, food, or clothing, but assists country leaders to develop policy and build capacity for self-directed training, technical assistance, and network building, targeted to achieve sustainable school feeding programs. Realizing childhood hunger cannot be resolved by only one organization. It has established strong partnerships with both governmental and non-governmental and private sector organizations who share their vision. The annual Global Child Nutrition Forum 
assist leaders in developing countries to come up with a country plan to start or expand school feeding by building technical capacity. In the past decade, the forum has brought leaders together from over 200 governments and non-government um, positions from 80 countries in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East. And in September, we'll be meeting in Cape Verde uh, in the um, West Africa. Adapting to change is about collaboration and partnership, key elements that together offer a solid framework for tackling the challenges that we experience each and every day in our profession and personal lives. As I close, I wish to share with you an old Ojibwe tribal proverb. Knowledge we receive from the Creator. Strength is found in our faith. When the storms of life challenge us, we must focus on our goals and we will keep on the right path. Finally, remember there are six things you can never change. <laughs> Number one, getting older is inevitable. Life is not always fair. Some people will never like you. I have a feeling there are some stakeholders at home that don't like me. Um, you cannot change people. Life is a constant challenge. And remember, things are bound to change. Thank you. Do you have any questions? If so, you need to come forward to the um, microphone. Any questions? Well, thank you. You were a great audience. I want to I want to thank Penny for her uh, inspiring uh, lecture that she gave to us, and also I want to invite Jeffrey uh, Schugert up because we would like to uh, to uh, give to you a token of our appreciation, as well as to honor oh, your thank selection you very as the forty first Grace Thank, thank you very thank you much. So thank you very much. You had a much. wonderful, wonderful grandmother okay. who was a leader in dietetics, and you need to be proud. Thank you. So I suppose that is the end of our program. So thank you for coming. We have to take that back. Yeah, I do.